Hello, welcome explorers and science seekers. My name's Dan. This is the Fun Kids Science Weekly. It's the only show that gives you a full tour of the universe and gets you back home in about half an hour. We're going to learn some secrets along the way as well. This week, we're talking about a fishy reptile from way back. Also, you can hear about a mission for Martian rock. And we'll learn about a holiday to space. That's coming up first. Talking about space, let's get a lesson from the smartest school outside of the solar system. This is Deep Space High. Deep Space High. Space for all. Jump into a wormhole and travel to Deep Space High. The school is space. But hurry, because lessons are about to begin. Morning class. Now we've been thinking about all the exciting jobs that you could do in the future and we've been finding out that space jobs aren't just for boffins building rockets. Space is for everyone. Whatever your interest, there's a job for you in space. So, stats, let's hear from you. What's your favourite topic? If it's stats, it's bound to be science. Well, duh, of course. I'm not top of the class in chemistry, biology and physics for nothing. Oh, right. And don't forget top of the class for boasting. (laughs) So, stats, what is it about science that you like? Uh, well, I suppose it's because we get to do experiments, find out why things happen, how to change things. It's just something I like doing, even when I'm not in school. Knowing about physics helped me to modify my space scooter to be able to travel in nine dimensions. I didn't know there were nine dimensions. Cooking is basically experimenting too. I love coming up with new ideas like fizzy ice cream. And when I'm in my galactic greenhouse, I love trying to work out what will make my Neptunian nastatiums grow the best. But... Space travel isn't the time for inventing, is it? I mean, by the time you're ready to launch, you need to know what's going to happen. Not be doing an experiment into whether you'll make it into orbit or not. (laughs) On the contrary, experimentation is a huge part of space exploration. Not about whether your rocket works or not, although you need to know the answer to that, but space is a great environment to do experiments into other things. They're always carrying out experiments on the International Space Station, and there's no gravity there. Things behave in weird ways. That's right. Let's have a peek. Computer sim, ISS if you please. Ah, let's observe this experiment. The astronaut is wearing high-tech shoes which measure what's happening to her body as she exercises. Anyone care to guess why? Without gravity, the body doesn't have to work as hard to move. That can make muscles weak. I guess they're studying movement to help astronauts stay healthy? That's right. OK, computer. Next sim, please. Looks like these scientists are studying some vegetable seedlings. They want to see how the seeds grow up here and whether without gravity in natural daylight they might turn out different to on Earth. Why might we need to know that? I guess when we live in space, we need something to eat. And it's better to eat something that's easy to grow and doesn't mind being in space. That's right. As you can see, many experiments are to help us go further and stay in space for longer. But experiments undertaken in space can also help people back on Earth too. Scientists here on the space station once found that because of the way certain chemicals thrive in space, it was possible to make a new drug to treat muscular dystrophy. And on another occasion, from experiments with mice up here, they found a drug that can treat certain bone conditions. Right, let's get back. Computer, end sim. Science comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, just like you lot. (laughs) And, as we've seen, rocket scientists and astrophysicists don't have all the fun when it comes to space jobs. Biologists, chemists, ecologists, botanists, even psychologists can help make tremendous discoveries by carrying out experiments in the unique environment up here. Does it sound like something you might like to do, Sam? Not really, sir. I like things to be more... predictable, I guess. As predictable as me coming top in class? All right, brains. That's enough. This lesson might be over, but don't worry, Sam. We're not done yet. Next time, I'll be asking for more of your favourite topics, so have a think. And have a think about leaving the room quietly for once. Deep Space High. Space for all. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. 
right, it's question time on the show. You send your sciencey bits to me, the stuff that is keeping you up at night, that's racking around your brain that you can't figure out. I will do all the science smart stuff for you. Our first question today, you need to leave it as a review, by the way, over on Apple Podcasts. Should have said that. It's the most important part. Uh, Ralph has done that. He is eight years old. He says, why don't we get pins and needles in our sleep? Ralph, mate, I know that I do. Do you ever get that? When you wake up and you kind of move your head off your arm and suddenly, oh, absolutely kills. It really, really hurts. You do get it in your sleep. It's something called temporary paresthesia. What happens when you put too much pressure on an arm or a leg? You pinch the nerves and the blood vessels that are in it. Now, nerves carry information to your brain. When you release, when you take the pressure off, the blood floods back to your nerves and they start firing stuff to your brain again. And they do it so quickly. There's so much nerves going on. There's a rush of information which make you feel tingly. Now, you can get them in your sleep. It just depends how you sleep. Clearly, Ralph, you sleep very well. If you put too much weight on your arms or your legs, though, when you're fast asleep, when you move, you'll still feel a bit of pins and needles. Thank you for the question. This is from Dylan and Imogen's mum, who says, where do cow pats go? She sees animal poo in the field and a few days later, it's gone. Now, it's hard to find out anything properly scientific about this. A few reasons, though. Maybe the obvious, maybe the farmer's cleaned it away. Uh, Maybe it's been washed away by the weather. And insects from the soil do break down dung. They want to get all the nutrients they can to help them thrive. And this can take anything from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. So perhaps that's where your cow pats are going, Dylan and Imogen's mum. Thank you for the question. Uh, And lastly, uh, on Apple Podcasts, this is from uh, Milo, who was six years old in June. Milo. I'm a little bit late on this. You can blame me and your mum also says blame her as well. Happy birthday for June. I hope you're feeling brilliant now you're six. Uh, Milo lives on the Reunion Islands with his brother Isaac. He wants to know, why do we always see the same side of the moon? Uh, It's because of something called tidal locking. Now the moon spins on its centre, just like the Earth does. But the moon spins at exactly the same time that it orbits around the Earth, once a month. Now, it happens in sync, so you only see the same side of the moon because it's spinning as it's spinning around you. It's doing it exactly the same time. It's one of those brilliant quirks of nature. That's why you only ever see the man in the moon. If you've got something that I can answer next week on the show, leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, you know that we're always on the hunt for science stuff that is mind-blowing, that is jaw-dropping, and it helps, it helps if it's a little bit gross. (laughs) And this today is all of them, by the way. Scientists have been studying dinosaur poo, and they think they found a new species of beetle. Now, Martin Kvarnström is from Uppsala University. He's on the line. Hey, Martin. Hi, Dan. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for being there. Now... I need to start at the very beginning. Why are you looking at dinosaur poo? So by looking at the poo, we can tell what they were eating. Uh, And by looking at their diets, we can start to reconstruct who ate whom and have a better understanding how these extinct animals interacted with one another. So it's really looking at their diet that is my interest by looking at the poo. How do you know... Who is eating who? And I mean, is it just because you see part of an insect in the poo? Uh, I mean, that's a really tricky question because when we find fossilized poo, it's really hard to trace back who was the producer of this poo that is now fossilized. Uh, But when we look at a dig site and we try to look at all the different kinds of shapes that we have in the different kinds of poo, so we have big poo, small poo, and of various shapes, we can start to link back to the body fossils, so the bones we have from the same locality. Uh, And there are some clues, such as size, shape, but also what they contain. So by looking at the food remains that are still preserved within the fossil poop, 
and linking the poop back to the producer, we can start to get a better understanding of how these animals were interacting with one another, who ate whom, and what kind of parasites they had. So what have, apart from this, apart from what we're here to talk about today, what have you learned about dinosaurs from studying their poop in the past? So for, for example, we uh, looked at the fossil poo of a, a really early dinosaur, and we could see that it was full of bone remains, but like chewed up bones, so small pieces of bigger bones, and also broken teeth from, from the coprolite producer, so the producer of the poop. Uh, and we could tell that they were chewing bones, just like hyenas are doing today. So we, we wouldn't have been able to say that only from the uh, shape of the teeth and by looking at the bones of the dinosaur. We really needed to look at evidence of uh, feeding, so looking at the poo. And by looking at that and also uh, other trace fossils, which is like traces of the extinct animals, we could also see on the bones that there were bite marks on them. Uh, so. It, We can learn a lot about behaviors and diets and so on. That was just one example. We have tons of such examples by by looking at copper light. Now, I I know the poo is from millions and and millions of years ago. Uh, what What does it look like? Does it smell at all? It doesn't. Thankfully, it doesn't smell at all because it's all fossil now. So it's all minerals um, and they're really hard. And that's also a problem because if we want to look inside them, we have to have a really like use sophisticated methods because they're not transparent at all. So you can't look through them and they're all mineralized now. So what we do is scan them with really, really powerful x-rays. Uh, and when we do that, we can start to see what is inside. And then we have to work with really powerful computers to render these things in 3D. So we get these beautiful models at the screen, but it doesn't look like that at all when we first scan them. Uh, but then they come in all different sizes and shapes and so on. And the particular uh, dinosaur poo we're going to talk about today is just like, I would say, thumb size or even like half uh, half of a thumb because it's not... Comp- uh, so like a little, like just a little nugget of the stuff. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So what, what the, the, the poo that you found this, this discovery in, what dinosaur is the droppings from? Um, so... This dropping is from a very early dinosaur, possibly not even a dinosaur. It might be a very close relative, so a cousin of the dinosaurs, called Cilisaurus opolensis. And it was living in what is now Poland, but 230 million years ago. Uh, and this is the, the like, the, it was living uh, at the time of the first dinosaurs. So dinosaurs haven't yet taken over and become, like, dominant on Earth yet. It takes another say 30 million years, 30 million years. Uh, And it was a fairly small animal that weighed approximately 15 to 20 kilos, maybe a little more than two meters long, including the long tail, uh, walking on all fours. And it had this little beak at the tip of its jaws that we think was used to root around in the litter and and, uh, feed on insects and, and other prey. Now, when you were studying the poo, and you've gone through a lot of work to study it, it sounds like, you know, you're putting it in the computer, you've got to render it into 3D. It's not just as simple as sticking it under a microscope. When you're looking at that poo, uh, what are the signs that there might have been uh, a beetle there? Um, so, so in this case, by just looking at, at, at the surface, we, we couldn't say what, what it contained. So it was just really on the scans, we could see small bits and pieces of the beetles, especially if we think about beetles, they have two pair of wings, right? And the first pair is just, it's not for flying, it's just cover wings. So they're covering the actual flight wings when they're not flying. And these are called elytra. And since they are really hard, because they're made of this exoskeleton, uh, a lot of them preserve really well compared to other parts of the beetles. So we first saw a lot of these elytra in the coprolite or in the fossil drop. And and this is a new beetle species than it led you to to discover. What was it about this stuff in the in the droppings that you thought, oh, hang on, we've never seen this before. That might be a new beetle that we didn't know about. <laughs> yeah. So first, when we look closer at 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 this uh, the different kinds of beetle remains we saw that a few of them were almost complete like with the head and the antennae and the leg and everything and these are tiny tiny beetles just 
one or two millimeters long. So really, really small. If we would see them today, it would just like be small dots on the ground moving around. We wouldn't be able to see, you know, any details like on bigger beetles. And, and when we understood that we had so many of them, so well preserved, we realized, okay, it must be possible to describe this um, on a species level. So we contacted beetle specialists who normally work on recent now living beetles uh, and asked for help. Do you want to describe this beetle with us and see if it looks like anything that is already described or if it's something new? And when we think about how many kinds of beetles are around today, there are so many, there are thousands and thousands of, of species that it was probably the same back then, but we don't, we haven't discovered so many. So chances are, uh, pretty high that this is going to be something completely new to science. Uh, and it turned out when we looked at it that it um, it is a new kind of beetle, uh, not only the species, but the whole family of beetles that it belonged to uh, is a previously unknown family of mixophagan beetles. So it's a type of beetles that are around today and are really small. They live in moist or wet environments, typically on algae, and presumably they also eat algae. Uh, but they're quite rare today, and and this finding suggests that yeah, they've been around for a long, long time, and perhaps they were even more diverse and common back back then. Now we know that small things can make a big difference in science. These this tiny new beetle species that you may have found, uh, what impact does that have on other things that we might have thought about life from way back then? Um, so a number of things. Uh, the first one is, uh, I think what is important with, with this study is that we found beetles that are almost complete, beautifully preserved in a dropping, in a fossilized dropping. And this is not something that we perhaps, or most people perhaps, um, expected. And the most beautifully preserved insects are normally found in amber, so fossilized tree raisin. Uh, but the problem with amber is uh, that it was only formed relative in relatively young geological time period so we're talking about 140 million years ago and more recently where most of it was and no insects have been described from from older deposits than that in amber so this really opens up a new window to looking at early insects and early beetles uh, and it also says something about the beetles that were around at that time we can compare it to modern beetles, now living beetles, and see what kind of families uh, or what types of beetles were around at that time, how they differ from, from now living ones, and we can see how different families of, of now living beetles differ from each other and when these differences occurred. Uh, lastly, uh, Martin, it, an, a man that studies poo, studies dinosaur poo, part of his job, what what would be a really exciting find for you? Like if you found some T-Rex poo, for instance, would that just blow your mind? Like what would be a really exciting discovery? Uh, that would be really cool. And in fact, there is uh, there is uh, like really, really big uh, dropping that has been linked to T-Rex or some very similar dinosaur, uh, at least, because it's so big and full of bone remains. So that's, of course, really, really cool. But for me, it's not really just finding something extremely exciting in one dropping, but to look at many, many different kinds of droppings from the same place and try to get the whole un uh, understanding of the whole food web. And then we can also see how these different animals interacted. And if we look at food webs across time, we can start to see how these evolved as well and compare them. And that's something really interesting that I hope we can uh, look into in the future. Well, wow. I mean, I've loved chatting poo. Uh, Martin Kvanstrom from Uppsala University. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It was a pleasure. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're headed into the past again. and We're diving into the ocean. You know how dolphins and sharks are fish-shaped mammals? Well, the ichthyosaur was a fish-shaped lizard. Now, there are many types of the ichthyosaur that started to appear in the sea about 245 million years ago. The Shonisaurus grew up to about 15 metres long. The ichthyosaur would have had a long, jutting jaw. 
looks a little bit like a snout. Now, some of these ichthyosaurs would have razor-sharp teeth as well, stabbing out from their jaws to catch the large prey. They were a bit like a big dolphin. They had a thick, thrashing tail, and they skulked around the oceans with the dinosaurs on the land. Thing is, the experts think they went extinct about 20 million years before the dinosaurs. Hardly a snip of time, is it? 20 million years. They were around 245 million years ago. That's why this big fishy reptile sharp teeth it could be massive 15 meters long that's why it needs to go on our dangerous dan list we've just heard about the ichthyosaur time to learn about more dinosaurs now to go and meet some of them with another age of the dinosaurs age of the dinosaur with dinosaur action magazine the number one mag for dino fans Welcome to the end of the Jurassic period, 145 million years ago. As the Jurassic period came to a close and the Cretaceous period began, many new types of animal and plant life were evolving and a new kind of creature was starting to take to the skies. Birds. Watch out, something is swooping at us. Wow, it's an Archaeopteryx, the first known bird. Only 10 fossils of the Archaeopteryx have been found, but they're important because they prove that birds evolved from dinosaurs. However, they were very different to birds we know today. The Archaeopteryx was the size of a crow. Whilst they had feathers, they also had teeth, claws on their wings and long tails. They also weren't great flyers, more likely to glide for short distances rather than flap about. He hasn't seen us, he's perched up in the tree. Being able to hide in trees is a great way to stay safe. It's believed that small dinosaurs evolved into bird-like creatures either to help them escape from predators, more powerful dinosaurs who preyed on smaller and lighter creatures, or to help them go after prey that lived up in trees, such as insects and small lizards. To survive over thousands of years, these small dinosaurs evolved. They grew long but light feathers, and their front legs got longer to form wings that would help them fly. Other dinosaurs grew feathers, but as they stayed too large, and as their arms weren't strong enough, they never flew. One such dinosaur was the Dilong, which was the same size as a dog. Although he couldn't fly, his feathers would have helped him keep warm and might have allowed him to show off to other Dilongs when competing over territory or mates. Quick! That's not a bird! It's a flying reptile! Let's get out of here! I think we're safe here. Along with the early birds, pterosaurs ruled the sky. Pterosaurs didn't have feathers. They were flying reptiles with strong arm muscles and wings made of thin skin. But don't worry, that's a Ramphorhynchus. He's mostly interested in sea life. He flies low over the lagoons and uses his pointed beak to grab at fish and other small creatures. Paleontology, pick. When all that's left behind are fossils, it's hard to say what color dinosaur skin or Archaeopteryx feathers were. Recently, scientists have discovered small parts of pigment cells called melanosomes. Through the use of clever technology and comparing results to today's animals and birds, they can make some amazing discoveries. For example, they now know that the Sinoceropteryx, a small bird-like dinosaur, had dark-coloured stripes along its tail and an orange-coloured crest along its back. The Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Let's get this week's science in the news. NASA's Perseverance rover on Mars is getting ready to take its first sample of Martian rock. It will drill into the red planet and take a finger-sized slab of rock so experts can study it to see if Mars has ever held life. Also, the billionaire Jeff Bezos has made the short journey to space in Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket ship. There were four people on board, his brother, 
someone, a young 18-year-old who bid millions of pounds to be there, and also uh, an old, uh, sp- and also an old flight pioneer who was over 80 years old. They were up there for 10 minutes and 10 seconds, and they think maybe it'll open up now for normal people to be tourists in space. I mean, normal people like me and you, not billionaires, having a holiday across the galaxy. And finally, earlier this week, the Met Office, who look at the weather across the UK, they issued the first UK extreme heat warning. All four nations in this country recorded the hottest day of the year last week. England, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, they climbed to 33 degrees in some places. Experts think this is a sign of climate change and it's likely to get worse and hotter year on year. And that is it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly. If you've got something science-y that you want answered on the show next week, you can leave it as a review for me on Apple Podcasts. That's where you need to go. Uh, also, while you're there, leave us five stars. You can also hear some of the other brilliant podcasts that we make at Fun Kids. You've got them on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com as well. Also, we've got our live show in a couple of months' time at the end of August. You can come and see Fun Kids Science Weekly live Help me search out some science secrets. We'll do some experiments there. It's in London at the Underbelly Festival on the 27th of August. You can get your tickets right now at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen to us all over the country on your DAB digital radio, on that free Fun Kids app, and at funkidslive.com. 